off again. 295, two, 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 $295,000 uh, in valuation, according to the Department of Finance, nine dwelling units, one open violation, charges owed $1,790 at 0.6% loan to value ratio. So you can see where I'm going with this. These, <laughs> in the interest of time, I won't. I think I've um, uh, set this up pretty well. I'm gonna now pass on back to my colleague, Richie Torres. No, let's go to members. Has deferred to members, the first person my first colleague who will be asking questions is Councilmember Kalos. Thank oh, before Councilmember Kalos uh, answers, I do want to say that Councilmember Kalos and I started this process many years ago working together on third party transfer, and I'd like to thank him for his continued support and advocacy around these issues, even though he represents Manhattan. <laughs> It's a problem in Manhattan, too. Uh, I want to thank the Housing and Buildings Chair, Robert Carnegie, for his leadership and partnership on third-party transfer. In particular, I want to thank the Black and Latino and Asian Caucus Co-Chair, Idanique Miller, and their members for supporting our efforts to take on the third-party transfer program, as well as the Oversight and Investigations Chair, Richie Torres. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our New York State Attorney General, Tish James, Public Advocate, Jamani Williams, Brooklyn Borough President, Eric Adams, Senator Brian Benjamin, Assemblymember Al Taylor, among many other elected officials throughout this state and city who have been calling attention to this issue. I want to thank Commissioner Luis Carroll for testifying today despite only recently starting at HPD. I pre appreciate your taking responsibility for your agency's mistakes. That being said, I'd like to direct my entire line of questioning to Kim Darga, your Associate Commissioner for HPD's Preservation and Finance Programs. Uh, Associate Commissioner Darga, did you appear before the Land Use Subcommittee on Planning Dispositions and concessions on third party transfers round 10 in, on August 14th, 2018. Council member, may I interject? Um, as the HPD commissioner, I'm the one who's testifying. I will ask for Kim, Kim Darga's help. Did Kim Darga appear it. before my subcommittee on August 14th, 2018? I assume the answer is yes. Uh, on that day, under oath, did uh, Associate Commissioner Darga say that all the tenants in affected buildings received notices and even could have a uh, say in who was going to manage their buildings? I can't, I can't account for um, what Ms. Darga Associate said. Associate Commissioner D Darga is right there next to you, so it is a good thing that she can answer. Um, I'll let Ms. Darga answer. What was your question, Council Member? Uh, during the hearing, uh, was any concern raised relating to whether or not tenants received notices about the third party transfer program? I don't recall. I remember you asking a lot of questions, but I'm sure I explained that we did a lot of notice prior to transfer taking place. Um, on, in general, it's about 40 different attempts, and including flyering buildings so residents knew what was going on and doing pre and post transfer meetings. And at the, so, so I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Now that we have 2020 hindsight, do you feel that that notice was effective? Council member, um, we believe our notice was effective because there were 420 properties that were selected and only 62 properties are now transferred. These properties have an average um, arrears to the city of $800,000 and about eight BNC violations. So we feel that our ability to get all those properties in and out of the process and paying their taxes and stabilizing is a success. Uh, may, may I have more time to continue? I, I would prefer not to go back to the chair's uh, exhibits, but clearly it, it was not effective. The other question I had during the August hearing was how were the people who were being given these buildings selected? Okay, so um, thank you, Council Member, for that question. 
the city selects um, not-for-profit owners, and developers, and for-profit developers that have uh, a presence, a track record, and a presence in the communities where these buildings are through an RFQ process. So it's a request for qualifications. Um, they have to go through a review process, through the mocks through review process, Vendex wants a review, where the city looks at their track record, the buildings they own, and their ability to provide rehab and also maintain these um, properties as affordable housing. Are elected officials able to weigh in on uh, which vendors who are responding uh, can get a specific building? So, you know, the RFQ process is a fair, transparent process, but of course we always take into account council members' experiences with developers and their abilities to pro um, to perform in your districts. In an analysis, I found that a lot of the larger buildings went to for-profit developers and smaller buildings went to non-profit developers. Uh, did any of those for-profit developers make campaign contributions to uh, elected officials or people involved in city government or overseeing HPD? So, as I said, Council Member, our process is an RFQ process. It's fair and transparent. We do not use criteria such as campaign contributions to select developers. What we do is we select people who have a track record of building and providing safe, affordable housing through a transparent RFQ process. You kept, you've said the word transparent, which is actually my favorite word. Will HPD, right now, will you promise to make the HPD compliance packages w that were submitted as part of round 10 available to the city council and the public at large, the entire HPD compliance package, So, because you're transparent. So council members, um, I will go back to my, my office and see what we can provide by law and what we can't, but I'd like to say that 94% of buildings are uh, owned by not-for-profits in this DPT program. The, the last and final question, I appreciate the indulgence from the chairs. Uh, during the process, I asked why the third party transfer program was necessary in order to give Article 11 tax exemptions, uh, and why not just give the HDFCs themselves directly the Article 11? Why not abate the water bills? It was something that got brought up multiple times. I'll record reflect there are a lot of people doing jazz hands in the audience. And I know that that happened multiple times in Councilmember Perkins' district. Uh, if somebody is in an HDFC, will you commit to making Article 11 available to them and making it retroactive so that it can go back 40 years and forward 40 years to obliterate all possible tax, uh, taxes that are owed? Councilmember, that is a brilliant question, and yes, Article 11 tax exemptions are available to all HDFCs, and we have tried throughout this process to get people to apply for these very Article 11 tax exemptions, and the properties that were able to do so did so, and the properties that where we did not have a working partner on the other end were not able to get through the process. But yes, we agree, um, you know, HDFCs can get an Article 11 tax exemption and um, f to, a bit to remove taxes, we cannot get rid of DEP charges through Article 11. I just want to acknowledge we were joined earlier by Councilmember Rosenthal and we were just joined by Councilmember Barron. Uh, in addition to Councilmember Carnegie, one of the council districts most affected is that of Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, who's our next question. Thank you so much. I want to commend both of the chairs. I've been in the council for 10 years, and this is one of the most uh, prepared hearings I have ever witnessed. So I commend uh, both of you and the staff. I have to tell you, Commissioner, you know how I feel about this. I am mad and live it, uh, especially to what happened uh, in my district, and in particular uh, to 1600 Nelson. I, I stood here, I sat here for the last two hours uh, listening about prevention, 